As Obama once said, who doesn't love Judge Judy? And to some extent, he's right. It's not hard to see why people like Judy Scheindlin. She's known for being blunt and unafraid to tell people off when they deserve it. If you like seeing liars humiliated on public television, then Judge Judy's show could be a guilty pleasure for you. It is for millions and millions of people for a reason. Her brand of common sense and vindication is usually received pretty well. Fans adore her catchphrases like, on your best day, you're not as good as I am on my worst, or beauty fades, dumb is forever. One journalist and longtime watcher went so far as to write, quote, if God is small, redheaded, Jewish, and female, this is what the day of judgment will be like. Her popularity is pretty apparent. Compilations of her absolutely roasting and destroying ridiculous plaintiffs and defendants alike gain hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views online. And Judge Judy was even more popular than Oprah at times. About 10 million Americans tuned in to watch her every day. That's more than Dr. Phil and Ellen combined. So there's really no overstating how popular the program is, but better yet, it didn't seem to be an act. Judge Judy wasn't just some persona that Judy wore, it's her authentic self. Years before her TV debut in 1996, Judy made massive impacts in family court. She got through more cases than most judges. She prioritized the well-being of kids that came through her courtroom, and she wasn't afraid to tell off family members and caseworkers that didn't put the welfare of children first. In a 1993 mini documentary, the impression Judy leaves behind is a powerful one. Fierce, but caring, not someone to be messed with, and a judge not afraid to make a few enemies if need be. Judy's personality is the exact same as it was in this 1993 miniseries as it was when her show aired in 1996. And this is something that plenty of people find, well, endearing about her. In a world of reality TV or hosts that put on a good look for the cameras while hiding monsters underneath, there's something really refreshing about a brutally honest TV personality. Her unapologetic nature is just plain entertaining to watch. There's really no other words for it. Plus, aside from a hairstyle shift, effectively nothing changed the entire quarter century that she was the queen of daytime TV. As the New York Times puts it, she made justice in a complicated world look easy. At the end of her program, things wrap up neatly with a bow. The person in the wrong pays a price and looks like a joke, while the person in the right is validated. If only things were that simple in real life, right? Well, as it turns out, nothing really is that simple. Not in real life, but not on Judy's program either. Hello, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be chatting about Judge Judy. Now, you've probably heard it said before that nothing on TV is real, but Judge Judy is supposed to be one of those exceptions. Articles from Cheat Sheet or Cold Wire explain that even though Judy is technically an arbiter and not a judge on television, everything about the program is genuine, down to the cases, the rulings, and her attitude. The little intro to her show advertises this, stating, real people, real cases, Judge Judy. Now, there may be a few nitpicky details that aren't all accurate to real life, like how it's not actually filmed in New York despite the opening credits using stock footage of New York City and the fact that it is possible for her decisions to be overruled. Even though, and I know that the show's tagline is all rulings are final would have you believe otherwise, that's not always the case. Plus, obviously this is a TV set first, a courtroom second, and even referring to it as the latter would be a bit of a stretch. Even so, I'll admit that I was honestly surprised how few fake cases have supposedly been on her program. In 2010, one episode featured an argument over smash TVs and a dead cat, but as the litigants later confessed, it was all made up to be on the program. Aside from this, there aren't really many accusations of fakery out there, but why? Why would someone want to be humiliated in front of 10 million people? Well in part for the free vacation and in part because they won't actually have to end up paying anyone. The wheels of justice grind slowly, but not on Judge Judy. If you're willing to trade a bit of dignity to be put up in a hotel in California, it really may be a better option for you than going through small claims court. Plus, even if you do win in small claims court, collecting is still difficult. On Judge Judy, you will get paid and probably a lot faster than you would through the legal system. There's no hassle of hunting people down and filing paperwork over and over either. 
And frankly, I find it pretty hard to believe that anyone's really getting justice here when there aren't any repercussions. Like it's great that plaintiffs who may be swindled get paid, but is Judge Judy really serving up justice if defendants don't actually have to pay a dime? No wonder it's so appealing for all parties involved. The only catch they face is that in the courtroom, you're under Judy's law and quite literally. As Byrd, the bailiff in Judge Judy explains, there's a bit of deception in terms of the justice you'll actually get in Judy's show. It's a well-intentioned deception, but is deception nonetheless, he states. See, Judy as an arbiter can make whatever decision she wants. She knows that the courts are slow and her show takes advantage of that fact and holding people to common sense law instead. While the laws in the US are far from perfect, at least they aren't one singular person's definition of common sense either. So then what is Judy's law? Peter Bresnan from the podcast, The Experiment, watched Judge Judy for some time and even read her book entitled, Don't Pee on My Leg and Tell Me It's Raining, which she published way back in the 90s. Within the book, Judy wrote that, quote, somehow we have permitted irresponsible behavior to be socially acceptable and have set up an elaborate bureaucracy that encourages lack of individual responsibility. According to Peter, this mindset can be a bit problematic. Judy believes in a world with more jails, harsher sentences, and fewer rehabilitation programs. He says that she uses a series of anecdotes from her time in family court to back this up, writing in her book about what she calls, quote, crack mothers, welfare scammers, and a new breed of violent juvenile delinquents. Over time, Judy has said that her opinions have changed, but she doesn't really go into detail explaining which ones or even how. Plus, considering that she's continually voiced these views on television, it doesn't seem like her thoughts on the justice system have loosened up whatsoever. And this is where I begin to have some issues with our blunt judge. I don't doubt that she saw some pretty horrific things in family court. And I respect that some of the choices she made were probably far harder than any choices I'll have to make. However, her attitude towards people doesn't just seem like tough love, it just toughness at times, honestly. In her book, Judy says that she believes victims are self-made, not born. Quote, there are many, many poor, disadvantaged people who had terrible parents and suffered great hardships who do just fine. Some even rise to the level of greatness. If you decide to be a victim, the destruction of your life will be by your own hand. Now, Judy isn't entirely wrong. You do decide your own fate and all, but it also comes across as kind of arrogant too. Considering her work in family court, shouldn't Judy understand how much environmental factors play a role in someone's development? We're not all born on equal footing with the same advantages. And while some people may be able to rise above their circumstances, I don't think it's fair to say that all victims are self-made either. Whether or not Judy intends it this way, her phrasing honestly reminds me of that PragerU video entitled, What I Can Teach You About Racism. I talked about it in my old PragerU episode, and in that video of theirs, a PragerU host explains that systemic racism simply does not exist because if you work hard and get educated, you'll be just fine. This toxic mindset fails to address redlining and other forms of systemic racism, as well as the classism in this country that fails to put everyone on equal ground. So in my opinion, it's just plain ignorance. But let's try to give Judge Judy the benefit of the doubt, right? Maybe she didn't intend for it to come across this way. And that book was simply her way of saying that you need to take the reins on your own life. Unfortunately, as much as I would love to believe that, the classism and racism on her own program, as well as the behind the scenes in her workplace, sure are not doing her any favors here. Let's talk about the problems that occur on camera before we get into the horrific ones that occur off camera. Recently, Judge Judy got a new show called Judy Justice. She left CBS making about $47 million annually by the time she retired from her TV program. And that was only to head over to Prime Video instead. As much as I'd love to hope that her harshness and even brutality may be a result of a producer's instructions, that really does not seem to be the case. As one in these times article puts it, Judy still has as much contempt for the poor as ever. She is quote, shockingly rude to people of color and people living in poverty and treats them in ways that she would never dare treat wealthy or middle-class white people. In the new program, Judy's featured screaming at a group of black women to sit before smugly turning to her audience. Quote, the message is clear. These people won't listen to reason unless you shout it at them. Episode 17 is apparently one of the worst as her program perpetuates harmful stereotypes about people in poverty having too many children. 
Judy also berates a woman for becoming a homemaker and collecting unemployment, saying that this is what's wrong with the government. I mean, sure, I'm all for Judge Judy lecturing someone for refusing to repay a loan and acting entitled to someone else's money, but scolding them for how many kids they have on a national television show is kind of pushing it. And it also feels pretty hypocritical when Judy herself has five kids too. Whether it's Judy Justice or Judge Judy, the classism, racism, and exploitation is at best an underlying theme. A previous plaintiff, Jonathan, who sued his friend Andy for hitting him with a glass one drunken night, told his story on a podcast, and he said that initially Andy had never wanted to do the show. He refused, but Judge Judy producers kept sending him letter after letter asking him to be on. One former producer, Mike Coplin, even admitted that they sent Andy a pizza from a local restaurant to persuade him. Andy was firm in his refusal and told Jonathan that the program was meant to profit from humiliation. But Jonathan kept insisting, knowing that this would finally be a chance to get paid. Andy basically had a choice to make, air his dirty laundry and stupid harmful decision out on television for the whole world to see, or go to small claims court and then be forced to pay when he couldn't afford it. If someone says no, that they don't wanna be on the program, that should really be the end of it. You wouldn't think that you would have to tell a courtroom judge show that no means no, but it seems that Judge Judy's producers need to go back to first grade to understand that lesson. But it gets worse because apparently while at the doctors, Jonathan asked to have a spider bite on his thigh looked at. This was only meant to be in addition to the cuts, a sort of, hey, while I'm here, can you look at this type of deal? But Judge Judy on television, might I add, called it a lesion on his groin and implied that Jonathan had an STD to about, I don't know, 10 million people. So the truth is in this case that no one won here. The defendant felt pressured into something he didn't want to do and the plaintiff was undeservedly humiliated. The only person winning is Judge Judy who gets an interesting story in case for her TV program. Now this exploitation would be pretty harmful enough, but allow me to repeat myself cause I'm gonna do it again. It gets worse. Did you know that Judge Judy's producers are apparently extremely racist too? And no, I don't mean that a few things have fallen into a gray area. I mean that they literally stated they don't want black litigants on the show because as executive producer and director Andy Dowett put it, I don't want to hear no black language on the TV. We've seen the exploitation and questionable values that are plastered on air for millions to see. But now we're about to head behind the scenes and look at who makes this program what it is and it's not very pretty to look at. Ground rules about what the courtroom show will take on make sense. Judy herself vetoed open criminal cases, cases involving sex work, and she wasn't a fan of ones involving dogs either. And I can understand that, limits are important. Dowett, on the other hand, wanted to screen out black litigants as much as possible. Initially, when I read this, I had hoped that maybe he was trying to do this in some sort of attempt to prevent the harmful criminalization of the black community, but that's unfortunately not what was happening. Instead, he told producers that he wasn't doing any more black shows and he didn't want to hear black people arguing. Allegedly, he didn't care about how they represented marginalized communities. He was just straight up a racist bigot. A 2009 lawsuit from former senior producer, Jonathan Sebastian spoke about this in great detail. Keep in mind that Sebastian was just one man going against Paramount Pictures. So while it's certainly possible that he was lying or stretching the truth, I highly doubt that a lawyer would take something as daunting as this without any merit given the claims. Within the suit, Sebastian said that after working on Judge Judy for seven years, he gained a reputation as a stand-up employee. In 2007, he did receive his very first written warning, though it seems like no real reason was actually given. During his meeting with Dowett, Sebastian was shouted at and called a fucking loser and mocked. As Sebastian alleges, considering his stellar reputation until that point, he believes this warning was done to give the executives ammunition and a record to fire him later. He had never gone along with the discriminatory selecting process of screening out black litigants. He never approved of it. And Dowett didn't seem to like being opposed. Whenever Sebastian presented Dowther with cases, he'd return any with black litigants for a whole host of excuses, including calling the cases, quote, too ghetto. This suit from Sebastian reached a settlement for an undisclosed amount in May, 2009. And Dowett and his attorneys continued to deny any of the accusations. And if no one else spoke out, then maybe his denial would have some merit, but that's not what happened. 
because six former staffers told Insider the exact same things. Dowitt didn't want too many black litigants on the program. Business Insider wrote in 2021, quote, one former associate producer recalled a meeting in 2011 or 2012 in which they said Dowitt told staffers not to bring in too many black people because it would make the show look ghetto. It seems like the word ghetto is a favorite of Dowitt's really. Employees also stated in internal chats that their good cases would be put on hold while quote, fucking dumb cases would go through just because the litigants were white. Race and appearance were both clearly important to this director. This insider article also shows a little grading card in which Dowett would determine if he wanted someone on the program. Some of the qualifications honestly make sense. You want both parties to be articulate with a unique and compelling story, but to rank their appearances and write people gross in the comment section, that doesn't seem quite right. That just goes back to an exceedingly judgmental and disgusting director. He definitely didn't talk about the litigants like they were people. It was like they were subhuman, another former employee said. Apparently, if a plaintiff or defendant showed up with bad teeth, Dowett would get pissed at any employee that failed to screen them properly and ask, quote, who is this disgusting person? One former producer alleged that they even sent a litigant to a salon to have her hair redone and her lip waxed. But when it was time to film, Dowett still turned around to the employee and asked, who is this scum? Weight, appearance, teeth, and even disabilities were allegedly all subject to Dowett's crude comments. He made pig or cow noises at those he didn't find attractive, though if he did find them attractive, he'd say he wanted to get with them. Basically, everyone was at his mercy one way or another, unless they were upper middle-class white people. Aside from how obviously disgusting this is, there's also the fact that his bills are paid because of the people coming onto the Judge Judy program. Dowitt, Judy, and anyone else working on the show makes a living off of fans watching these litigants. So the very least they could do is show them respect and gratitude, but it doesn't seem like respect is a word in his vocabulary, even if it's something he's demanding from others. It wasn't just him though. While Dowitt's racism was supposedly glaring and apparent to anyone that worked with him, supervising director Victoria Genist and executive producer Amy Freiselbin were also accused of participating in fostering a toxic workplace culture. Staffers were pitted against each other, threats of termination were frequent, cases were manipulated to increase drama, they celebrated a vicious contempt for litigants, the list goes on and on. But I'll say this one more time, it gets worse. Now, before we continue on to the next section where we're going to discuss sexual assault allegations and the eventual fallout from the show, I'm gonna take a quick moment to place today's sponsors right here. So if you are thinking or considering maybe not going on because you're not in the right headspace to hear about this next section, and this would be a good time to stop the episode. If you're thinking about it, listen through the ads and then I'll see you in the next section. Let's get on with the ads then. Changing seasons mean changing tastes. And with 30 or more weekly recipes to choose from, HelloFresh has something for everyone. Easily customize your meals by swapping proteins or sides, upgrading to choice proteins or adding protein to a veggie meal. And this season you can have your pumpkin spice and eat it too with a rotating selection of fall inspired items from HelloFresh Market. From brunch kits to a fall dessert board, you'll find everything you need for your favorite autumn occasions like tailgating, Oktoberfest, and more. Or if you're like me, you can get into soups because fall is also soup season. And they had a really good coconut curry soup. I haven't seen it again on the menu, but like, please bring it back because I'd like it again. It's really good. If any of y'all had it, let me know. So if you're ready to spruce up this fall season, make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash casket65 and use code casket65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash casket65 and use code casket65 for 65% off plus free shipping. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds, anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn about creativity and leadership with Anna Wintour. You can improve your wine appreciation skills with James Suckling, and you can learn modern Japanese cooking with Nikki Yakayama. With over 150 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. Now, I started with Masterclass taking the Nikki Yakayama Modern Japanese Cooking, and I did get a little freaked out at like filleting fish. I don't know why, it's just not for me. I'm a big baby about it, whatever. But then I got into wine appreciation with James Suckling, and let me tell you, he is absolutely refreshing, and so are the wine choices, might I add. 
I feel ever so slightly more educated when I go out with my friends to dinner that now I can look at the wine list and go, hmm, I understand some of these words now, which is much different than it was before. So even if I'm not like some super worldly person, I feel much more confident ordering wine at the dinner table. And that means a lot to me. Now, what's really cool about Masterclass is you don't have to do like the full series of the class from start to finish. You can break it down in even like little 10 minute sections too. You can go at your own pace, choose how fast or how slow you wanna go. It's all about you. So the point is, I really highly recommend you check out Masterclass. You can get unlimited access to every class. And as a listener of the channel, you can get 15% off an annual membership. Make sure you go to masterclass.com slash casket now. That's masterclass.com slash casket for 15% off Masterclass. Please note that this section is going to discuss sexual assault and harassment. If you're not in the headspace to hear about that, feel free to end today's episode here. Now, it's probably no surprise that Dowett, in addition to everything else, has also allegedly sexually harassed the women in the Judge Judy workplace. Courtney Bullock, a former producer interviewed by Insider, claimed that Dowett would repeatedly touch her inappropriately, ask her about her sex life, tell her sexual jokes, and attempt to set her up with a married friend during her time working together. She rebuffed him and was later fired, though it's unclear if the EEOC even investigated her claims. Another employee, a segment producer named Sean Griggs, said that Dowett launched a personal campaign of gender harassment against her, to the point where she took a medical leave of absence just to get away. He'd call her ugly, criticize her hair and weight, humiliate her in staff meetings, yet also grab and kiss her head too. Like Sebastian, she also was threatened whenever she tried to be more inclusive in casting litigants. Though Griggs tried to speak with one of the higher ups, such as supervising producer, Victoria Jenist, it went nowhere. Instead, Jenist allegedly told her to schmooze and flirt a little, which is disgusting. I don't think I can really imagine how infuriating it must've been to be told that. Eventually, Griggs understandably could not take it anymore and left. Though she tried to sue, the judge in this case found that Dowett's behavior, sporadic comments about her appearances and a kiss on the forehead, did not create a hostile work environment. I think we can begin to see a pattern emerge with Dowett. He treats someone like trash, they have the absolute nerve to stand up for themselves, and then they leave, whether that be willingly or unwillingly. His assistant, Nancy Berry, admitted that Dowett would even have fits of rage towards women and claimed that he asked her, when are you going to fuck me at one point? So yeah, Nancy didn't wanna stay either. Even more upsetting is the speculation that Judy herself protected him. One former staffer says that Judy only trusted Randy and though there were so many times he should have been fired, Miss Judge Judy herself, this great bringer of justice, stepped in and saved him. Quote, Judy knew she was untouchable, Randy knew Judy was untouchable. And Randy also knows that Judy would protect him at all costs. If this is true, it makes things all the more gross and to some extent reminds me a bit of Ellen too. In both cases, Ellen and Judge Judy were the face of an iconic, immensely popular television program. And in both cases, their higher ups were allegedly disgusting to their staff. My opinion is the same for each situation. Both Judy and Ellen should have cared about their employees more. If they just didn't know, ignoring the lawsuits and court records coming out about them and their higher ups for years, then it's negligence to the highest caliber and they should be ashamed of themselves. If either of them was aware of the situation but didn't act, then it's exceedingly hypocritical for Judy Justice to blatantly ignore sexual harassment under their own noses. Whatever the case may be, it definitely reflects pretty poorly on their characters and deservedly so. All in all, out of the 16 people Insider spoke to, three former employees said they had positive experiences. So that's not exactly a great ratio. On the other hand, one Judy spokesman said that about 75% of those that worked on Judge Judy have now moved on to her new program, Judy Justice. Why would they do that if they hate the workplace, right? Plus no complaints have been filed on the new set. So does this mean that things have changed? Well, apparently no. In 2020, the pandemic allegedly made things worse as Dowett and Frizzlebin disregarded employees' fears about COVID. March 12th, 2020, one day after the pandemic was declared in the US, Frizzlebin was caught on video telling staffers to keep booking litigants because quote, 
What's the risk coming to this office doing your job right now? And what's the risk? Oh, I don't know, maybe a silly little thing called COVID, maybe getting sick or spreading it to immunocompromised and elderly people. No, we didn't think of that at all. Employees shared their concerns, some saying they had high risk relatives and coming into a poorly ventilated building with sealed windows wasn't exactly ideal. And it took a lot of pressure for Dowett to even budge and agree to a work from home setup. But what about Judy Justice? Maybe Judy has more control now with this Amazon Prime series and things maybe are changing for the better? Well, it also doesn't seem that way. Multiple times over the years, Judge Judy has said how much she values her producers, saying that she's the luckiest on-air personality in the history of television to have Dowett and Frizzlebin working for her. So that sure just doesn't sound like the words of someone that's skeptical or wary of the higher ups she has on her team especially when she made these comments in 2021, well after those accusations came out. Between the classism, racism, sexism, and the infuriating actions of her producers, it's hard for me to think that Judge Judy, or Judy Justice, I should say, really gives a damn about her employees or litigants. She seems to be like this no nonsense, but lovable character on television, while behind closed doors, it feels like there's a lack of empathy present. It's actually her bailiff bird that exemplifies this pretty well. Despite Judy saying that they're friends and their chummy relationship on screen, she didn't invite him to be a part of Judy Justice. Hell, Bird claims he didn't even know there was a new show to begin with until it was announced on Ellen DeGeneres' show. So that's one hell of a way to find out, right? Plus, while staffers expected Bird to be the one to present Judy with her Lifetime Achievement Award at the daytime Emmys, it was Amy Poehler who handed it over. Poehler herself even said, "'I wish Bird, your bailiff, could hand you this award the way he hands you photos in court, not making eye contact with the queen he has sworn to protect.'" Bird wasn't even seated with them, by the way, seemingly not by his own choice either but watch the Emmys around 10 or more rows back from Judy and Dowett with other show producers. Sure, that would be fine if they simply had a working relationship and weren't close, but then why does Judy call him a friend? Why say one thing in public in front of cameras, but act another way when the cameras aren't rolling? Well, the short and simple answer is it. she seems that she's a bit of a hypocrite. Now, I can only speculate, and I don't know what is in Judy's mind, obviously, but personally, I find it pretty damn hard to assume the best. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you'd like to connect with me outside of this show, make sure to click in the description box, go to my Linktree link, and you'll find all my social media and projects I'm involved in. Thank you so much for joining me for today's episode. I really do appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye. 